with no further ado, I will introduce our next panel, Alberta's Accelerating Machine Learning Innovation. With our moderator, Niraj Gupta. Niraj is an expert in AI, ML, IoT, product management, innovation management strategy, international business expansion, patent consulting, and legal tech. Niraj is chairman at the India Alumni Chapter of KTH Sweden and is on the board of KTH Alumni Advisory. Niraj holds a Bachelor of Technology degree from India Institute of Technology in Metallurgical and Material Sciences and a Master's of Science degree from Royal Institute of Technology. Niraj is author of the book Creating and Safeguarding a Strong Intellectual Property Portfolio, which was written in collaboration with SIDBI Adelphi and KFW Bank Germany. I'd like to warm welcome to Niraj to the stage. and his fellow panelists. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, Nicole had a family emergency, so she had to fly back to Edmonton. But we have three very good experts in AI machine learning. So, rather than I talking about the fun facts and introducing themselves, if you could talk about yourself and your fun fact, actually. Awesome. Uh, While well, I was trying to come up with a fun fact, my wife told me uh, this just means you need a lot more hobbies. <laughs> I didn't have many fun facts. Uh, one fun fact is I won't turn down an opportunity to go cliff jumping. Uh, so that's it for me. Have you broken anything? <laughs> no, no, not yet. Uh, my name is Tiffany Linky Boyko. Uh, I'm with a firm called Flying Fish Partners. Uh, my fun fact is I'm an avid reader, uh, but I have to stick to non-fiction when I'm not on vacation because when I'm reading fiction, I have to find out what happens, and it often means that I stay up till the wee hours of the morning to find out who killed who and why. <laughs> Is it working? Okay, wonderful. Hi everyone, my name is David Chan. I'm with the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. I've been with them for uh, over three and a half years and I'm the product lead on their industry team there. And my fun fact, I actually, I asked my wife as well for ideas for fun facts, but i have got to admit she wasn't much help. So I asked my friend and he encouraged me to say that, you know, every soccer World Cup I root for Switzerland, even though it's fairly pointless. So I'll leave it at that, um, kind of open-ended there. Perfect, thank you. So we have a startup, an entrepreneur, investor, and one of the most uh, prominent institute, uh, institutes in, uh, in uh, North America. Uh, so I'll start with a story. I used to be the chief strategy officer at Adabotics, and when we were uh, at Series B, everybody started asking, where's your AI and machine learning strategy? Um, uh, we were dodging that question. We became this half a billion dollar company back then without doing AI and machine learning, any kind of AI machine learning. And then uh, a couple of our clients started asking. They said they have, they have their AI machine learning department and they wanted to work with us. And that's when we started looking into what exactly should we do. And uh, it took us nine months, literally, to figure out our strategy. And then we applied for a grant with Scale AI. And Scale AI said, all this is bullshit. Just <laughs> come up with two specific uh, use cases. And that's when we started working with Alzheimer and Amy and uh, started working on it. And two years down the line, we had a very robust AI machine learning department that contributed to our growth. So, you know, a lot of times we keep talking about the growth of AI and machine learning, especially in Canada and Alberta. So, what are the factors because of which we are talking about this AI machine learning data science? Start with you. Sure. Um, and just to give you guys context, uh, I run a startup called SketchNet AI. Uh, we're in a unique position. We work with construction companies, um, and we have customers across Canada. Um, we're tackling, we're building AI models to help tackle a very manual and repetitive process. Uh, so construction companies spend a lot of time uh, reading through construction drawings to get the true accurate cost or measurement of how much a building will cost. We take a process that takes a couple of hours, a few days, run it down to, to seconds. Um, I think what I've seen is companies are know that they're in a competitive environment uh, and they're looking for opportunities to leverage technology to solve some of those pressures that they feel. Um, it's harder to find skilled, qualified labor, so estimate, finding estimators, for example, is a very uh, challenging 
It's, it's a very manual and repetitive uh, job, but it's hard to find good estimators. So when we talk to companies, they're saying, um, well, if we can automate these workflows, we're definitely wanting uh, to do that. Um, and so that's increased, uh, increased the appetite for adoption because we're solving ML companies and us, we're solving real, real problems. I mean, I think that growth in Alberta um, really is rooted um, what's happened, been happening for years at the University of Alberta um, and the work that Amy's been doing, and David would be better to speak to that, but, um, you know, for our firm, that was a real key point of interest of, hey, these are brilliant people that are known internationally, that are, um, you know, doing research that is known internationally. That's, we think there's an opportunity to see, um, you know, that research come out and start to be commercialized and work with those companies. So for us, that um, was a really exciting point and we see an opportunity and I think um, all of that really, you know, helps local um, industry, uh, you know, be involved in the bigger, broader uh, global conversation that's happening uh, with AI. Yeah, I love the, both the points that were made actually by Tiffany and by Daniel because I think they both would contribute and, and I absolutely agree with that. I definitely have an Amy lens to this and so uh, maybe I can expand a little bit on what Tiffany was alluding to there. So, you know, in Alberta we're in a pretty unique position. I'm not sure if how broadly people are aware of that, but there's been really decades worth of investment in AI research by the provincial government here, really being fairly forward-looking in terms of investing in, in this research area. And as a consequence of that, right, we've built up some global leadership in this area when it comes to specifically reinforcement learning is one of the areas that we're really well known for. And really that's then paid off when Canada, on a national level as well, was very forward-thinking. So in 2017, Canada was the first country to introduce a national AI strategy, the pan-Canadian AI strategy. And as a part of that, they invested $125 million in three centers of excellence around the country, Amy being one of them, and really each of them being founded where there was a nucleus of AI research in that city, so Edmonton at the U of A, uh, Toronto, and then Montreal as well. And so really, I think those foundational pieces have really built up to where we are now by enabling us to uh, really build up this key expertise and now trying to take that from the academic sector and, and bringing it into the commercial sector and industry as well. And as you alluded to, Daniel, I think the tools are getting much better all the time and making that barrier of entry, if you will, lower and lower, which is, I think, also seeing the, the development and growth cat being catalyzed, essentially. Yeah, I actually wanted to mention that I'm a direct byproduct of that investment that's happened uh, within Alberta. And when I, I was just at a conference in Charlotte um, and people are surprised about what, what you're able to do with AI and ML. So seeing that the Alberta is generating companies that are doing transformational things uh, is a byproduct of the work that uh, the government has done and institutions um, here are doing. Perfect. So talking about the research part of it, uh, you know, a lot of fundamental research is happening at the university in EE and the kind of institute. So when we start looking into research to commercialization, so uh, Tiffany, from your uh, point of view, how do you look into those startups which are trying to, from automation to proactivity, what you were talking about, where AI comes up, machine learning comes a picture, how do you judge those kind of companies and how do you start interacting with the uh, organizations like Amy? when you're talking about the startups like this? Yeah, I mean, we, um, our firm in particular, we love um, technical teams. Um, you know, the AI and ML um, talent is still in short supply. So when we have a business team come to us and say, we have this great idea, um, we go, cool, you are gonna have a challenge attracting that talent. So we love technical teams. Um, they come with a, a, a unique challenge, um, and especially if they're from research. And so a lot of times the conversation we have internally is, is this still more of a science project or is this ready to be you know, out in the world? And so anytime we can see um, more examples that they've done pilot projects, um, you know, learn things and you know, try different things, help us um, get some comfortability with um, it being at a point where it's ready to move out. Um, it also depends on which um, market they're looking at. So is there a large enough opportunity? Are they still very you know, focused and see it as like a niche op, you know, area to, to focus on, um, is that industry that 
there looks like there's potential. Is that industry ready and actually open for disruption? Um, you know, or is it still one that everybody sees the opportunity but isn't quite ready to adopt? Um, you know, I think that's changing over the last couple of years, or a couple of months, I should say, um, with just AI being brought, you know, in a broader lens. Um, but it's still, you know, those are some, a couple of the things we consider when we're looking at the research piece of it. Daniel, when uh, the companies come to you and they start looking into, okay, we want to do something with the AI machine learning, but the objectives are these and these and these, uh, how do you start working with them? Because a lot of times, a lot of professors are research-led and fundamental research primarily, so what's the kind of a process when you're interacting with these companies? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, okay, how much, how much detail are we going to go into here? So how much time do we have? But I think Tiffany, you brought up an important point, which is like not all companies are at the same stage and they don't all have the same needs, right? And so when it comes to commercialization versus research, it really depends on what company we're talking to, where they're at in their stage, in their growth stage, and then also what is the difficulty of the problem that they're solving? And that is actually a pretty key question to ask because if it's a really sort of new novel challenge that they're trying to solve that's almost you know, at the very, very cutting edge, sort of a research type problem, then you're more on the R&D side of things, and that's where you oftentimes need that really narrow and deep expertise, that research lens, in order to actually, you know, push the frontier of what you can do with AI. But then on the other hand, you also have a lot of companies that are, they want to implement use cases that have been demonstrated before in other areas, maybe similar areas, or in a different place around the world, but they don't have the in-house capacity yet to get started with that. And so that's a totally different question and you need a different approach for that, right? Because then you're much closer to just using tools that have already been built, uh, reapplying approaches that have already been proven out in new areas with new companies. And so really it depends a lot on which, which company and where the client is at, what kind of problem that they're trying to solve. And so that's one of the beauties, is, and sorry, not to wear my Amy hat too much here, but that's one of the beauties of, about Amy is that you know, we're connected to that really deep cutting edge research lens. And in the case of antibiotics, I think that's where really some of that expertise really can shine and help you move the needle on what cutting edge things you're wanting to do. But we also have the expertise, folks with industry experience that have done this in industry before that can help companies understand, okay, you're trying to pick up a lower hanging fruit. How can we help you implement that faster and get commercialization faster so you can really start on that AI ML journey more effectively? Perfect. So, uh, I was gonna say, the other thing that um, I find when we have conversations with teams, especially coming out of research, and one of the things that sometimes is a barrier is this like, but I don't want to be a CEO long term. And so having that conversation of it doesn't, you starting a company, being one of the founders doesn't mean that you long term um, or even immediately need to be the CEO or you should be the CEO. And that, you know, I think um, has stopped um, people from pursuing those opportunities. And so I think having more of those conversations and going, hey, that doesn't mean, you know, you don't have to be what maybe you've seen in, you know, the movies as, you know, being that startup founder. What that looks like should be different. Um, and if, you know, you really drill down into the whole range of startups, um, you see that there is a range of people, a range of founders and the roles that they play within that. Uh, just to add an element here, I think there's opportunity when thinking about commercialization for a lot more collaboration to happen across um, different in, different departments within the U of A or, or different players. For example, I, I have a combined degree in business and construction management. So when I was doing the construction management, started getting exposed to AI research around the construction space. Um, my initial idea for the startup was uh, a search engine that was leveraging some of the research that I had seen uh, in the industry. Um, but when I went out to the market to talk to customers, they, they were saying, well, that doesn't really solve my problem. So as startups and, and founders, we have to stay nimble uh, and ask the difficult questions. Okay, what, you know, why is this not a challenge? If it's not a challenge, going to the, the, the uh, the next person and keep asking the question. So when it comes to commercialization, research could be there, but if the research is very honed in on solving a specific problem, that element of uh, staying nimble and understanding what the 
consumer really cares about can be lost. That's where collaborations are important uh, to be able to capture uh, what industry cares about and then what, what actually the, the technology that would solve that problem is. You mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, Tiffany also uh, mentioned about the talent part of it when we were talking about CEOs and CTO of a company. So uh, from the AI machine learning standpoint, when you have to start working with Amy, uh, how do you hire those people? Did you have AI machine learning co-founder or like how did you solve that issue? Yeah, well, for me, um, I, I really appreciated the, the business background or the MBA because it gave me the confidence to know I don't have to do everything. And so when it came to even finding the right ML talent, ML is very difficult and it's challenging. And it's not until you go through uh, different people, you find, okay, this person's not really solving the problem. Uh, that's where working with companies like Amy um, and other more established companies can, can really help with solving that. I, for me, I, I started looking at, okay, from my networks, who are those people who are already solving these problems and how can I get help there? So um, it's important for startups and companies to know what they're good at and what they're not good at and how they can go to find, where they can go to find those resources. Perfect. I'm one of the co-founders of a company called AI Foundry and we invest half a million dollars in AI companies. And we have these five verticals called data, domain, talent, research and infrastructure. Now, with ChatGPT, how do you see these factors coming along? Because it's a new big thing, every single common person is using it. The other day, one of the startups I invested in, I said, can you write a vision and a mission? And uh, she came out with four vision and mission, and everything was ChatGPT. So what, what do you have to say about that? Like, how do you see ChatGPT playing a very important role in the startup and research and scale of work? I mean, I think from a startup perspective, um, we've been having that conversation a lot uh, and seeing a lot of companies that suddenly have popped up and we're like, look, we're using this. And so our question is, but so what happens when Microsoft does the same thing um, or Google and there's oftentimes not a great answer. And so our struggle from a startup perspective is the like moat and, you know, around that. Um, you know, what is, you know, going to stop anybody else, you know, one of the larger ones from doing anything. So I would say we're probably a little on the less excited a startup side um, of things being built on top of it. Um, we're seeing some that are you know, using it as an aspect of it versus like the foundation of their startup. But um, it's definitely something we're having lots of conversations about looking at these startups um, and see... Still haven't seen anybody that's really come out and gone like we've used this in, a, in an interesting way that you know is you know something going to be harder to um, uh, kind of be mowed over by one of the big ones. But yeah, it, it's a really fascinating <laughs> area that's moving so fast. Like we're you, we're used to things moving really fast in AI and ML, but now with the whole Chat GPT, GPT four, it's just mind blowing how much faster it's moved, right? And and. So I, I can maybe anecdotally tell you a couple of conversations I've been having. So there's, companies are sort of thinking about, okay, so what does this mean for me, right, in terms of GPT-4? Um, should, should I be building this in? Because it's so easy to integrate natural language processing using GPT-4 and has so much potential. But if it's so easy for me to build into it, then my competitor will build it, build it into it as well, and then it really does give me a competitive advantage. But I think, I, where, where I think it's going a little bit is, is like you're not, building it in to have a competitive advantage, you're building it in not to be left behind, right? Because all the other people are going to be doing it and suddenly you're going to be the one that doesn't have the most recent um, large language model built in and you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage compared to some of the other companies. And I don't know if folks can, if that resonates with folks because I'm sort of like seeing that, oh, Atlassian is saying that they're going to have GPT-4 built into you know, Jira and their, their product soon. Um, no, and uh, Snapchat just have a, has a GPT-4 powered chatbot that they just released. So everybody seems like is you know scrambling to basically be the first to implement it. But I think other folks are going to catch up, and it's sort of going to be uh, yeah. You, you will have to sort of take advantage of those tools in order not to be left behind. Yeah, it'll be the new baseline. I'd like to at least have that. I think the other piece that is uh, the big conversation is okay. What information should your company put in? What shouldn't it? How do you start to figure out where those um, boundaries are? Um, I've had a few conversations with people around 
every time I put out, um, you know, this is how our company is going to use it, somebody comes with a new example. And so um, it's not simple to write, um, you know, standards and expectations for companies because there are so many um, ways that it can be used. And I think we're still just sort of trying to figure out where it could be detrimental um, for, you know, companies. So th that's a very fascinating uh, piece. I'm glad I don't have to write any of those. So sorry to any of you that do. <laughs> I, I would answer it on two sides. So I've asked um, our team members, how are you using ChatGPT? Uh, and I can see that engineers' productivity has gone up. Uh, so some of them are two times, three times more productive in that they're solving problems a lot faster. And it's removing that element of, okay, let me search Stack Overflow or Google for 10 different versions. Um, so it's helpful there, uh, but it's also a certain type of engineer who will be able to use it to increase their productivity. And that productivity increase uh, uh, varies. The other side is on customers. Uh, so for industries that have uh, had difficulty adopting technology, now I have a similar or common language because this parent, who's a steel fabricator, has a child who used ChatGPT to write an essay. So they're, they're much more open and curious about, okay, how's now machine learning going to transform my workforce or my, my, how, how can I adapt or take advantage of this technology? So um, it's, been, it's been great from my perspective, talking with customers and just seeing a different level of understanding and curiosity is what's possible, how far can this uh, go, what, how accurate uh, are the models you're building. So it's, it's, it's definitely been a good wave um, that's, that's helping us with the conversations on both sides. Yeah, it definitely has fast tracked the adoption of AI machine learning. Um, so when we talk about adoption and we, uh, I remember when we started doing AI machine learning uh, at Adobotics, we said that we wanted to create the best applied platform we didn't just want to create, uh, create the fundamental because uh, a lot of people started talking about IP and they said that they weren't sure whether the IP is into creating the fundamental algorithms versus the applied algorithm. So when we talk about the domains, do you think, there are two questions, do you think there are enough IP being created around AI machine learning when their companies are applying these uh, technologies? And the second question is, with Alberta specifically in oil and gas and energy, do you see the kind of becoming a market leader in creating those kind of vertical around AI machine learning? I think in some cases um, there isn't enough IP being created. And so I think that is some of the conversations we have. Like, hey, there's nothing here that is going to give you a benefit or you know help you know you against your competitors, um, which I think is related to like the conversation we have around chat GPT is just like there's you alone aren't creating anything enough of significance. Uh, so I do think um, there is a, that, that opportunity. And I think that's where, you know, um, some of the stuff that is still maybe not as um, popular right now in the AI space um, is the things that we're more interested in, like the reinforcement learning piece of it. It's not the trendy thing right now, but there are still a lot of really interesting things that are happening within research. And I think those are the things that we look to go, yeah, I think there's more opportunity right now to be creating specific IP attached to it. Um, David could probably answer it better, but he might be too modest around Amy. Um, I think that uh, Alberta has a great advantage um, or from you know the industries that already exist about implementing AI because of the opportunity with Amy. And there's a fan fantastic industry team, and I say it because we send some of our companies there, direct them there, um, to be able to work with these incredible researchers, these incredible minds, to help to figure out what are some ways to implement it into these um, specific companies and industries. Um, and so I think that gives you know, local industries within Alberta a great advantage um, to be able to work with um, you know, these people in their backyards um, that are able to help reimagine aspects um, of the industry. Well, thanks, Tiffany. No I'm, not, I'm not gonna deny that. <laughs> I'm not gonna fight you on that one. I think when it comes to IP, I, I, I don't really have a good pulse on whether we're creating enough or not, but I do think there is this kind of interesting struggle, right, between creating IP and then between also wanting 
access to AI systems to be open and, and democratized. And you know, this is something as well that we're seeing in the news a lot, right? Because I'm sorry, I don't. Know, someone's gonna like call me out on this after afterwards. How many times I mentioned GPT-4? But for example, with GPT-4, right? Like there was a paper published by OpenAI talking about GPT-4 that they just released. But really, they didn't divulge much information, right? So they didn't say what data it was trained on. They didn't really say what algorithms they used. They kept a lot as proprietary information for themselves. And so that even further deepens the problem, right? Because first of all, there's only a select number of companies that can build these huge models that have the, not the right resources and that amount of resources, like the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebook, the Metas, and the open AIs. And then above that, they're not even being open about the methods that they're using to create some of the systems that they're building. So I think it, that, you know, there's a, a bit of a struggle there because we want IP to be created and to stay in Alberta. Uh, on the flip side, when it comes to things like large language models, I think there's a real struggle about making sure that it doesn't just stay within the hands of the really rich and powerful. Uh, to add on to that, um, IP being created I think for startups is a bit challenging. <laughs> you you know you have to apply for patents. You have to look for uh, what's unique about what you're building, uh, and you can have decision points. And we've had decision points where you're having to decide: okay, do I chase uh, a patent or do I chase commercialization? Uh, and those are real real challenges that I think startups have. Uh, also, technology is changing so fast where you can choose to patent something and by the, by the year, the, the next year, or by the time you're actually realizing that patent, um, you know, technology is, <laughs> you're, you're behind on that. So uh, we, I think the real, um, the real value is in the people and the fact that we have institutions building uh, people and training people to understand uh, how to deliver this, these, um, technologies to the marketplace. I think that's that's where Alberta stands. A huge benefit. Yeah. So, uh, has it ever happened that uh, any venture capitalists have come to you asking that you don't have any IP and they're not going to invest because of that? Um, no. I, and actually, maybe for software companies, before I thought it would be uh, it would be a big problem. Uh, some VCs are see it as a waste of time. So why are you not spending enough time talking to customers, building what they need, uh, and expanding? Um, I'm sure you're going to have a, a variation of what VCs care about, um, but I, I haven't heard that question yet. Maybe, uh, Tiffany, you can answer uh, whether, you, whether that's I wrote a book on IP, so I have different views. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it depends on the company ultimately, um, but uh, we've certainly turned away um, down companies because of a lack of um, protection around their IP. Uh, I think it's also we've turned away with a lack of understanding of what their IP is, whether that's something that they patented, but an understanding of like what actually makes them competitive. Um, I think whether or not it's documented, but you should always be able to understand and articulate very well um, what you have created that is going to be different. And that's very important. Uh, and it's a, um, uh, like th this is interesting. It doesn't have to be, the IP doesn't have to be filed in form of a patent all the time, and, but you need to know what's your IP. So coming back to the infrastructure, because uh, you know we talk about compute, we talk about infrastructure. Are we ready as Alberta? Uh, uh, do we have sufficient infrastructure? Or if not, then what do we need to do to have that kind of infrastructure, especially compute? <laughs> so, is it, so you're thinking compute, compute infrastructure, right? Yeah, apparently. Okay. So, I can I can comment from a research side and a little bit from an uh, industry side as well. Like on the research side, there's definitely um, resources like Compute Canada that make infrastructure available for for researchers that are doing AI research. Daniel, maybe you're familiar with it. Um, I can also say that, that this is actually something that's exciting on the Amy side of things because in the last renewal of the Pan-Canadian AI strategy, which I think uh, over tripled the amount of investment in the AI strategy compared to the first round, uh, there was a component that is actually for compute infrastructure. And so it is shifting a bit to that and, and appreciating that need and that, uh, that, 
that demand for computer infrastructure, specifically for AI and ML, because it is so important in order to advance research and discoveries in this area. Um, and I know there's other supporting bodies as well, like in, in Alberta we have, for example, Isaac, um, which also helps startup companies uh, that are looking for compute, res compute resources in, in order to develop their, their products, essentially. So when, when we talk about data, uh, you know, especially the traditional industries like construction, oil and gas, a lot of time data is with the large corporates or with the government. So when you started working on, uh, on your startup, was that a challenge? It, uh, it was one of the first challenges that we had to solve because uh, without data, there's, there are things that you can do, uh, but when you go into a production environment, your, the, the applicability of your models will, will fail. They might not be as accurate as you need them to be. Uh, we, we strategically focus on a problem that had data that companies didn't utilize. So for us, it's construction drawings. Every construction company will have construction drawings that are archived in folders and no one uses it for anything. So we were strategic in that. We knew that these companies were sitting on data that they didn't know how to tap into uh, or unlock. Um, the nice thing is we've, we've bridged that gap to show them, okay, this is how you uh, unlock it. This is the value that you could get from or realize uh, from all this data. Um, and so it was, a big, it was a big challenge in trying to educate the consumer or these companies as, okay, this is how you can start to use the data that you already have. I know some companies struggle with because they choose problems. They choose to solve problems that they don't have data for. And so then it becomes, okay, what's your data acquisition strategy? And so you're five years in building your data uh, acquisition strategy and you can't implement the problem that you've chosen to solve. Uh, that's where having the domain expertise comes in and asking questions like, okay, what, what are your biggest challenges? Okay, this problem won't have enough data, this one does. Uh, that's, that, that's been my experience with data. So Tiffany, uh, uh, when we talk about angel investors and um, pre-seed stage and seed stage funds, um, especially in AI machine learning, what do, you, what, what do you see in terms of, if I'm going to be an angel investor in AI machine learning, what should be my role apart from investing? Um, do, you, do you, as a fund, help these startups in any ways possible? Uh, yeah, I mean, we our approach is less about a, like playbook. Like here's you know we do this with all of them. Um, we or either look at and go, okay, which stage are you at? What do you need? So we have some that come and they you know this is their second company. They kind of know the the piece of it. Um, we do work with a whole bunch of them that are like we have no idea now where, where do we start? And so for us, we work with putting you know, okay, where's your gap? You know, what's the next piece that you need some support around? A lot of it is helping tell the story. Um, oftentimes it's building out um, and even getting a first um, design partner is not the biggest gap. It's going, how do you tell the story of, to get your next partner? Um, how do you t um, tell your story to get paid? Uh, how do you tell your story to get your next round of funding? So we do a lot of work around how do you articulate this very technical thing that you are working on into a way that is understandable to the audience that you're uh, trying to sell to. Perfect. Well, I'm running out of questions. If you guys have questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, I see one hand. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, that was a great panel. Thank you. Um, so I have a question regarding uh, the democratization of the technology. Um, and it's that, do you think that integrating, and this is like a long shot, but do you think integrating generative AI with blockchain technology would provide a path to democratize this technology? Uh, well, does anyone else want to jump in? <laughs> I can go for it. Okay, so I have to, I guess, caveat it. Like, I'm not a blockchain expert, so I can't really comment um, too much on that side, unfortunately, and I apologize if that's a cop out. Um, I, I think this, I think, I, I think I understand where you're coming from in terms of being able to assign attribution and, and, and who, who did what on that front. Uh, I think that, that can help in terms of the applications and implementations of things. I think the piece that I was uh, alluding to is, is more about 
you know, who has the resources to really develop and build these systems and, um, and, and who gets access to kind of provide input at that level, right? Because if it's only in, in the hands of the few, how do, we, how do we make sure that it's sort of built for everybody, right? Um, and so that's, I'm, I'm not sure if it will provide an answer for that part of it. Uh, uh, one important thing is that when we talk about uh, AI machine learning and blockchain, uh, blockchain can really validate a lot of data. So data allocation and validation is a very important factor when you're talking about machine learning, especially in data science. And that's why blockchain technologies are extremely critical right now. So when the companies are using blockchain to, to kind of have that credible uh, indexing of the data for the machine learning, that becomes extremely valuable model. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think uh, I can't comment on the blockchain, uh, but on the democratization of these models and access. I think knowledge and information, educating people to see what's available is a big part of it because the developer community, and I'm new to the developer community, I'm not a developer, but from, from, my, from where I'm sitting, I, I see a, a very open community that's, that's um, helpful and, and shares a lot of resources. So for people wanting to get involved uh, with it, there's a lot out there already that can be used to solve real problems. Uh, it's just people knowing where to go to, what resources, how to educate yourself. Um, I think there's there's a lot that's open. Obviously, there are limitations that uh, individuals, startups, smaller companies will be. There are limitations to how far they'll get. But without without much democratization as stands, there's just there's so much opportunity already that we can seize what's available. I mean, I think generative AI is already opening the door up to um, a lot of people being able to do things they couldn't before. So you could suddenly go in and create, like it used to be that you could use systems like that and create really, create really crappy logos. And now you can go in and create like an incredible logo that you would have to you know, hire somebody for. Um, you can go and create, um, you know, uh, music for a video you've created. So there's all of these things that suddenly are opening up. I think there are all these different questions that are opening up around like copyright and who owns what and how do you know. Um, so I think with this new um, opening and off, you know, kind of leveling the playing field, there's new questions that are going to have to be answered um, around that piece of it. Yeah, I, I was part of something called GPA Global Partnership of uh, on AI, um, and this is uh, uh, France and. Uh, 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 us, uh, Canadian government started that and now 28 countries are part of it. And one of the questions that we were trying to tackle was a machine invented a model and they wanted to file a patent. So the first question was who is the inventor? And the second question was there were four companies which had contributed to the data. So every company was saying we also should be the assignee of it. And that's, that's the challenge, we will, we will face those challenges, but one example I'm going to give it to you is, is uh, there is a, one of the richest families uh, and businesses in Sweden, it's called Wallenberry Foundation. And Wallenberry have created this democratization platform where there are already 52 companies part of it. The only uh, thumb rule is that everybody has to, uh, you know, share the data. If you don't have the data to be shared, you cannot be part of it, and now they want to uh, open it up for the general public as well. I think these models will start coming in. These are the early challenges. We are trying to figure out what are those challenges and hopefully we'll be able to solve those issues moving down the line. Uh, any other question? Here. Hi. Um, I think, uh, Daniel, part of the answer here is uh, the word trust. And it's, I mean, various institutions and groups working together, they gotta find a way to, to get past the trust barrier because they introduce a lot of people to various people and you know it becomes a trust issue. For example, you know I see a lot of the uh, ML happening in the University of uh, Alberta and then I know that's happening also in the University of Calgary and I don't see a whole lot of share going back and forth there very well or with the colleges, the old college, Red Deer colleges and the uh, agriculture space. Those are all big problems that need to be solved out there for food and that sort of stuff. So I think trust is maybe one of the issues, and I'll just close by saying, I took a patent the other day and put it into ChatTP, and it actually helped me rewrite the patent, and I got a new patent out of it. 
So the trust, yeah. you know, do you guys have to say anything about the trust part of it when you're talking about the companies and your model? I, I have an interesting lens to that because I've seen when you're building a business from the ground up, it's about trust. Uh, your first investor, it's trust. Your second one, your first customer, it's all about trust. Um, I'm not sure how the bigger organizations build the trust. Uh, the way I've found uh, focusing on the problem and the pain of the problem helps bridge that gap of trust, right? So is this problem big enough for us to solve? Like the pandemic, for example, all sorts of barriers and walls and trusts uh, were brought down because the problems were large enough. Um, and so if we can focus, I think, on the problems as institutions, uh, there may be opportunity for, and, and getting the right stakeholders to say, to scream and say, look, this is a big enough problem for me. I need you guys to start working together so that you can solve it because this is what this will mean for our employees, our community. Uh, so that's one way to, to bridge the trust gap. Yeah, as Tiffany mentioned earlier, the challenge with corporates are they are primarily trying to keep these models as trade secret, not filing patents. So a lot of knowledge is not shared, and that's why I say that it's very important if you need to do AI machine learning and need to build that ecosystem. Universities play very important role. Institutions like Amy uh, play very important role because they believe in the open part of the education, and that's where you could have access to all those research which otherwise you won't be able to do um, you know, as in your company. And uh, it will take time for big corporates to start sharing their trade secrets, but uh, uh, like we are looking at you and uh, uh, you know, other organizations in New York, Alberta and New York, Cali and different kind of institutes to do more research, which could then be applied as per whatever business model you might be working on, the other companies might be working on. Any other question? Yeah. I don't know, I think, hello. Uh, AI is really an interesting topic. Uh, I myself got into AI at the age of 15, built my first ML application around 16, and it's really interesting where AI is heading. And I think we're heading to a world where it's toward artificial general intelligence, but you know, there's different perspectives that we have in this space. And it's, it's really interesting right now because how people define the AI, it's like so many different things and people start using different buzzwords around it where it's right now AI is becoming a buzzword to some companies. But I want to approach this question from a different lens. And my question to you guys as leaders and professionals in this space, what are the potential benefits and drawbacks of re regulating AI, and how can these be balanced? Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, I think the challenge always when it comes to regulation is it's usually reactionary versus um, like something that's you know evolving based on information and pieces like that. So I think I mean, I don't have much more beyond that because that is like. But I, I think when we look to it, we have to look at, as just as AI is evolving, we have to look at making sure whatever we put in place evolves as it does too. Um, and that reacting to it in fear versus looking at, you know, what are we, tr you know, this might be something new and this might be, you know, create this bad thing that we're worried about, like jobs always comes up. Um, you know, but we, that's happened before and there's been new opportunities. So I think it's, it, anything around that needs to be iterative and, you know, open to changing um, as things grow. Um, but mostly I'm glad that I don't have to live in that space of like figuring out that every day. <laughs> you want to? Yeah, sure. Uh, on the regulation piece, I think uh, we have to ask the questions whether the institutions putting the regulations have have the knowledge and the know-how uh, to apply evolving technologies, uh, to, to apply the regulation in an evolving environment. Uh, I, what I've seen is that the um, if we put limitations on AI, we might be limiting innovation. So someone who's going to be 
10, 20 times more productive, is going to be able to think about problems and so solve different problems a lot faster. We all will have that opportunity to, to innovate a lot more. So I think the benefit uh, of AI technology is that it's going to uh, lead to a lot more innovation. So for the regulators, I think they have to think about how not to stifle uh, make sure that, okay, everyone is benefiting, uh, mitigate the unintended consequences, but also think about how not to limit the potential that has just been unleashed. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are initiatives which are being done, as, as I told you about GP, the most important part was all these countries are sharing their uh, you know, compliances and what could be done. And uh, there are initiatives within Canada as well. So Joshua Benjiro, who is like father of modern AI, started something called AI for Good, right? So there are these initiatives coming along and then governments are trying to work with them. And these experts will figure out what could be the ethical part of AI, uh, but it's very early stage. Yeah, absolutely. And Yoshia was actually part of that group, I think, that advocated for uh, a pause on, on yeah. development um, now that GPT-4 came out. And so I think what's really happened is that it has been a, a big wake-up call, I think, because it is so widespread and the, uh, the uptake has been so broad, it really has given people uh, the pause to think about what this really means. And so I think a pause on AI development is not really realistic, but I think it is really important that we start thinking about these things more and more and, and how what the regulation should look like. And I'm also like glad that I'm not the one that has to come up with this. Um, I think it, it's good though because it, you know it reminds me a little bit about like the conversation of, um, around ethics and responsible AI and things like that. Like initially, right, everyone just saw, oh, big data, data science, we can predict everything, let's just forge ahead. And no one was really thinking about ethics and responsible AI and those types of things. And now, now, now more and more it's becoming part of the mainstream conversation and you know the government of Canada is coming up with uh, frameworks and regulations in terms of what we what the guidelines are on that and so I think when it comes to AGI and the sort of the policies around all of that I think it's really good that we've sort of taken this stepwise function or exponential adoption because it does really bring it to the forefront of the conversation so we can think about it we do invest the right amount of resources in it so we can you know, set up the framework appropriately to not stifle innovation, but also do it as responsibly as possible. I also think the other piece of it is there's a whole, like, regulations could be in place, but there are whole groups of bad actors that are going to carry on regardless of it. So I know for us, some of the conversations we've had is what are the companies that we need to invest in that are going to counter some of the negative things. So one of the um, companies we've recently invested in is around identifying, um, you know, video imaging that is incorrect, like it is not that person. So, because that is a problem, it's gonna only grow, so you know, we need that countering piece of it. So those are some of the conversations we have is what can we invest in to kind of help, um, you know, not have that go rampant and identify that. You know, there are times that when we look at companies, we go, somebody else probably will invest in this, but we're uncomfortable with the potential application of this that's negative to um, you know, humanity or in a military setting, and so we choose not to. And so that is where that, you know, um, that lens around ethics and you know, having hopefully more people, more investors or more creators are having those conversations. Um, it doesn't take away from the bad actors, but um, you know, more of those that can be had kind of helps that piece also. Here, here. Now we have room for one or two more questions, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Um, and this question is sort of more related, it's a, a bit of a different um, perspective um, regarding communication. So um, prior to the massive boom of communication and almost like a marketing that happened with ChatGPT, which increased public awareness and excitement, were there challenges to implementing machine learning technology and solutions? Was there a challenge regarding that because of the lack of people understanding and awareness and just kind of knowing that this exists kind of thing? Yeah, I can jump in first here. Uh, definitely, uh, and that's something that we still encounter. I think now that 
you know, again, with chat GPT and GPT-4 being in the, in the media so much and having such widespread adoption, I think it will advance the conversation a bit. But I think there is still you know, a lot of hype around things, a lot of misconceptions about AI and ML. So what we actually like to do is start off all of our engagements that we do with, with, with companies, with, with education, we call it ML Foundations, really level setting in terms of what is ML, what is AI, so that you can hopefully sort of level set the understanding of those pieces with everybody and you're not facing that same uphill battle every time you, introduce, you talk about AI. You know, some person will be like, well, but what do you mean about that? So that everybody's on the same page. So absolutely, I think that is, um, that is still a big challenge and education, I think, can really help a lot with that. Yeah, I mean, I think before there was like all fear and like, do I really need it? And now there's suddenly like, wait a minute, I can go and use it, so maybe my company really needs it. I think there is still, you know, a lot of concern. Um, so while, you know, ChatGPT kind of encouraged an adoption, it's also encouraged the fear also. Um, so it's been simultaneous. Uh, but I do think that there, you know, it was a harder conversation. I think one that we still have is um, many of our companies don't need humans in the loop at all. Um, but there is still that fear of like, if we take them out, then the machines really have it all. Uh, the ironic thing oftentimes is the, the human in the loop in some of the systems that are the ones that are, you know, causing it not to work as well. Um, but there is still that fear around completely taking the human out of the loop. And that I think will take a while to... Um, you know, kind of move past that piece. Actually, I'll jump back in once more. I think the other piece as well where it can, where education can really help is in terms of the expectations management. Um, because oftentimes, you know, companies will start out with an AI ML project, and then if it sort of doesn't go into production and blow everyone's socks off, then they're really facing an uphill battle for doing more AI, more AI and ML projects. And that's where I think you know, expectation management is really key in terms of understanding what the difficulty level is in terms of implementing some of these systems and how experimental and researchy it can be as well. Um, and so, like, yeah, absolutely in terms of the education piece and, and making sure that everybody understands what, how these systems work, what the process is for implementing it, um, that it's not a linear journey, but much more of an iterative journey. Um, all of those things are really key pieces to help with adoption. Well, and I think we've forgotten, and uh, I think Nicole was here, she would remind all of us, like, because they live it every day, is it's hard. It's not an easy, just because it has now become a word that we all understand and we can go in and use something, we forget that that has built, been built on years and years and years of research tech, you know, um, and so it is hard to, you know, remember that when we see something really quick and fast in front of us. Um, to forget that there, it's still implementing something in your company, building something is hard, um, it takes time, and like any other technology piece, might fail, or it might need to change, or might need to you know, learn from that. Last question. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a bit about like, chat GPT. Uh, so I was wondering, for young engineers getting started in their careers, uh, do you think using AI tools such as, such as ChatGPT early on in their careers will hinder them or aid them uh, in their careers? And, because a lot of people are saying that uh, using these tools does take an aspect of learning out of the equation. I mean, I think in general, I think at the start of your career or learning, the best thing you could do is be curious. And so, Use ChatGPT, be curious about it. My husband's a teacher. Um, he teaches uh, grade 12 social studies. And he's like, I can fight against it, um, but I'm, or instead I'm gonna have a conversation about it and be like, you can use this on your test, but let's use it as a way to um, have you think about this topic differently. Uh, so I think anything could be a negative, uh, but I think lots of things can be a positive if you use it as one aspect to be curious and learn uh, while also be using other things. Um, I think it could be to your benefit, um, but it also could be to your detriment, but uh, mostly I think the opportunity is to be curious. Just to add on to that, I think uh, you can use it to answer surface level questions, uh, but you can also use it to get deep in develop a deep understanding of a certain topic. So I think the people who use it to solve surface level problems uh, and then they move on, those people, it'll, it'll be easy to start to weed them out, uh, especially in a, in a work environment where, okay, there's no depth to that. Uh, but if you, starting on, can start to 
use it, embrace it, understand that it's a technology uh, that's available, uh, but then push past push past the the desire to just say, okay, this ans this problem is solved. Add, add that curiosity aspect of how how was it solved? Okay, why did this work versus not? I think it's gonna help you uh, stand out amongst your peers. Well, I think Daniel said it really well. Problem solving. The problem, is, the, the challenge isn't whether or not you can access the information. You can Google everything. Um, again, referencing my husband, he's like, I don't need you to know specific dates. He's like, that you can Google that. He's like, what I'm looking for is, can you help process that information and explain why this scenario, he teaches social studies in history, was important and what did you learn from it? And so I think information is not the, you know, the thing. I can't wait for chat GPT to do all my PowerPoint so I don't have to do it. Um, but it's how you process the information, how you understand it and how you communicate it. Those are the skill sets that are much more impactful than whether or not you can regurgitate a whole bunch of information. <laughs> Okay. It's, it's not so much a, a question as it is a, a comment. Um, with the panel we just had, with your panel, I'm pretty sure the Terminator was running chat GPT-10. And my only request is, especially on the VC side, when you ask them how to turn it on, that's great, but find out how to turn it off. Because there could be problems, just saying. We don't invest in those ones. We try to <laughs> deter investment in those. Okay. Thank, thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, folks, we've come to that time of the day where we, we, we must part. On behalf of the Canadian Blockchain Consortium, I want to thank everyone in the room for attending. I want to thank the amazing volunteers. Let's get a round of applause for the volunteers. And everybody that makes events like this possible. And I also want to give a shout out to the grand and the amazing event team that works completely behind the scenes that you never see, who run the audio, the video, and make sure everything works absolutely fabulously. I would say seamless. And the amazing music they put on in between. I really enjoyed that as well. They created, they created the right tone. Thank you all for attending. It was a fabulous event. I enjoyed spending time with all of you, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Have a great weekend.